<clears throat> Psalm 85 is a very familiar portion of Scripture. In fact, one of the first songs, songs we sang this morning was from Psalm 85, and that is verse number 6. But we're going to read 4 to 6, if you will. 4 to 7. I still hear pages, so I'm going to wait just a second. Okay, turn us, O God, of our salvation, and cause thine anger toward us to cease. Wilt thou be angry with us forever? Wilt thou draw out thine anger to all generations? Wilt thou not revive us again, that thy people may rejoice in thee? Show us thy mercy, O Lord, and grant us thy salvation. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you again for the privilege of preaching this morning. I pray that you would take these verses and the verses from Genesis chapter 4 and work in our hearts this morning. We love you and we pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. A couple of different things we can see in these verses before we go to Genesis chapter 4 and one of which I've kind of made a point of a couple of different times but because of traveling and sick children and sick loved ones not everybody's heard it so those of you who may have heard this before, forgive me. In verse number six, it says, Wilt thou not revive us again? And we have established over the last couple of weeks that to revive is to make alive again. So when he says, Make us alive again, again, O Lord, we can learn a couple of different things. Number one, they're not where they're supposed to be spiritually, but they have been at some point in the past, and they have been where they are some point in the past, but Christ brought them back to where they should be at some point in the past. Okay, if we take this physical, in order to be revived, you have to have been alive before. And the example I used a couple of different times already is this year, it, the last two games of the College World Series was LSU against Florida, and Florida won both games. But LSU uh, strength and conditioning coach and the doctor noticed that a Florida fan had fallen out in the stands. And he was lying in the lap of a loved one, no pulse, no breath. They jumped up there and administered whatever uh, on the scene physical care they thought they needed to, uh, to give him. And the, the, I guess the happy part of the story is later that afternoon, he was in intensive care, but he was breathing, he was talking to his family, etc. They revived him. For all intents and purposes, he was alive, then dead, and then alive again. That's revival. That's the same thing that happens for us, in, spiritually speaking. If you're saved, then you're alive. And, and we went through Ephesians a little bit the other day, and I'm going to just kind of bring your minds back to it. Ephesians is written to, uh, basically, Hallman's paraphrase, the believers in Ephesus. It is addressed to the saints and the faithful. Okay, a saint is a saved, baptized member of a New Testament church that's in good stating, standing with Christ and his church. So it's written to believers. It's written to people that are already saved. All right. But, uh, you know, if you, we use Ephesians chapter 2 often to preach about salvation, to tell someone how to be saved. But if we look at the wording, even of the verses that we use, he's not talk, telling somebody how to be saved. He's giving them the details of their salvation. You hath he quickened. Ye hath he quickened who were dead. He's made you alive. God has made you alive, but you were dead. Before you were saved, you walked according to the course of this world. But now you're saved. You've been made alive. In verse number 8 and 9, which is what we can all quote, for by grace are ye saved through faith. It's not for by grace can you be saved. Ye are saved. You're already saved. He's writing to believers. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It's the gift of God. God gives every man a measure of faith. We need only embrace it. Uh, it's not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which he hath before ordained that we should walk therein. So Christ has not only saved us, but he's ordained or set in motion things that he wants us to do. Okay? If I do anything good, I mentioned in my prayer something that Janice had mentioned in Sunday school, which was really almost exactly something I wanted to watch. There's a movie I like, Miss Janice. It's a historical movie, and nobody else in my family likes it, so Nathan played on my phone while I watched Sheffy by myself. Sheffy is about a Methodist preacher from the 1800s. He died in 1902. 
Two things were known about Sheffy. He was odd, but he was God's. He would pray for hours at a time. And he said, at, at some point in the movie, he comes on, this is taken basically a book, a biography written of him and, and made that into a movie. A Christian college in South Carolina did it. But at some point he comes on to a family that's obviously struggling. Their horses just died on them right there. And he says, well, you can buy a horse in the next town. And the lady says to him in obvious frustration with the situation, she says, all we got's four dollars. Do you know where we can find a four dollar horse? And he said, well, just let me pray about it. Let me talk to the Lord. And he goes over and he sits down and he begins to pray. And the lady told him if he prayed for it, it it'd come true. She knew that if he prayed, God, God would do something. And he sat down and began to pray. And then he just goes, Lord, would you ask so much? Nope, that's what you want me to do. Okay, Lord. And so he gets up and takes the saddle off his horse and he gives it to them. He said, you can't do that. We know if you pray for it, God will give us a horse. And he said, sometimes prayer is just an excuse for what we know what to do. The horse is already provided. You need only take him. Okay? And so the old man carries his saddle to the next town and somebody buys him a horse. But the point is, he had this... this testimony about him that if he prayed for it, it was going to come true. If he prayed for somebody to be saved, they were probably going to get saved. I mean, he just had that kind of testimony. But all of us, even the best of us, have these periods when we get a little behind. We lag from where God would have us to be. And even in Ephesians, we're trying to Bring about what a revival is. Because I think for most of my life, I misunderstood what a revival is. I thought a revival is where a bunch of folks got saved. But really, a revival is where God's people get thoroughly right with Him. And where He's on the throne of our hearts again. And then our witnesses. We don't do it today, Michael. Revivals today, whether I'm talking to that Michael or that Michael, revivals today, they last from Sunday to Wednesday if it's a long one. Okay, But if you think about it historically, revival sometimes lasted two or three weeks for just the church folks to get right with God. And then lost people would get saved after God's people got right with him. And even though Ephesians is written to saints, so to people who know God and are theoretically right with God, chapter 5, verse 14, he says, Awake thou that sleepest and arise from the dead, and Christ will give you light. If I, I, I even as a, as a confident in my salvation, I can kind of go to sleep at the wheel. <clears throat> How do we know when we've, been, when we've been woken up, when Christ has given us light? It says, Awake thou that sleepest and arise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee light. See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, redeeming the time, because the days are evil. Wherefore be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. And be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing, and make a melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. A revival is where we get thoroughly right with God. Now, I told you in the text yesterday that if I were to give today's sermon, this sermon, a title, it would be, What Will Your Tombstone Read? And I was very encouraged watching the movie about Sheffy because this is a guy, uh, when he felt the calling of the Lord on him, the church leader said, you, you, you don't have what it takes. You can't be a preacher. And so he just went, Brother Jerry, to the wilderness, as it were, and preached to moonshiners and people like that and, and had a, uh, basically a ministry amongst people that the other people didn't want to minister to. He just went, oh, you, you don't think I'm any good? Well, I know this. God called me to preach, so I'm going out here to preach. And he was just used. And he had that testimony <clears throat> that if he prayed for it, it came true. What's, what's my testimony going to be? Is my testimony only going to be that I was a nice guy, that I was a good friend, or is my what's my tombstone going to say? What's your tombstone going to say? You say, "Well, I'm only ten. 
I'm only 14 and a half. I'm only, I can't remember and I'm not gonna guess, I'll get it wrong. Uh, I'm only however old. I don't have to think about that. But I think it's a sobering thought, isn't it? Once we get so tied up with the trivial things of life that we forget what's important. That's what the Sunday school lesson was about, right? We get so tied up about the future of this afternoon, the future of tomorrow, the future of August 6th, that we don't forget about the future of, that we do forget about the future of eternity. Turn to Genesis chapter 6. I told you that two things we can get from that verse that we just read in, or those verses we just read in Psalm. A, the people of Israel had been where they were supposed to be at some point. They're not there now, and they want God to get them again, get them there again. That We know that's one thing. Number two is we know he's done it before. And I think one of the first places we can see that happen is in Genesis chapter 4. Now I'm going to read the whole thing. <clears throat> it is what? 26 verses. I'm not going to read the whole book. That's 50 chapters, y'all. Shoot me. I'm going to read the 26 verses. And as we read through it, the first thing that's going to come to your mind is whatever sermon or song you've heard about you can't get blood from a turnip. Okay? We've all heard some teaching or some sermon about that, how Abel uh, gave the sacrifice of the lamb, which is what God wanted, but Cain gave the sacrifice of his works. That is an, a, a valid application, but I don't think that's the primary interpretation of the text. Okay? Because one of our points this morning was that God is changeless, right? Right? I see a couple of heads shaking, okay, or nodding. So one of the points was God is changeless. Changeless. We know that. Hebrews describes him as immutable. Hebrews says he doesn't change. <clears throat> Hebrews says he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. This is kind of, I'm, I'm going to explain it to you more as we go along, but God actually commanded that the children of Israel bring the fruit of the ground. So the problem with Cain's offering is not that he brought the fruit of the ground. It's which fruit of the ground. And the problem is not, because you're not saved by works, right? We just went through this in Ephesians. We're not saved by works, right? We are never, never saved by works. If God changed, some people tell you that, well, well, you know, I basically break history up into what we call dispensations. And I've heard people preach that during the dispensation of the law, you were saved by works. That would make God changeable, right? Michael David Dockery, if at one point he took somebody's works for their salvation, and today he won't take my works for salvation, is that not a change? Yes, it is a change. So... The works were never, the things that they were doing were never for their salvation, but evidence of their salvation. They were doing what they were told to do, which is proof that we're saved because we obey our Lord. Now, let's read the text. Chapter 4, verse number 1. And Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bare Cain and said, I have gotten a man from the Lord. And she bare again and bare his brother Abel. And Abel was a keeper of the sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. In the process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought the fruit of the ground. Notice the wording. Cain brought of the fruit of the ground. He brought of the fruit of the ground. Of the ground, excuse me, of the fruit of the ground and offering unto the Lord. Now notice the wording in Abel's sacrifice. In Abel, he also brought of the firstlings of his flock. And the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering. But unto Cain and to his offering he had not respect. And Cain was very wroth. He was angry. His countenance fell. You know, his lips pooching and he's red. And he says, what's wrong? And he says, nothing's wrong. We've all done it, right? When we're really mad and we feel like our rights have been violated. And people ask us, what's wrong? And we, nothing's wrong. I'm just fine. Right? That's what Cain does. Look at verse 6. And the Lord said unto Cain, why, why art thou wroth? And why is thy countenance fallen? If thou doest well, thou shalt be accepted. And if thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door. And unto thee shall be his desire, and thou shalt rule over him. And Cain talked with Abel his brother. And it came to pass when they were in the field. So God's trying to show him where he's at, trying to bring him where he's supposed to be. But it, did he get right? No. He's in the field with his brother. And 
Cain rose up against Abel, his brother, and slew him. And the Lord said unto Cain, Where is Abel thy brother? And he said, uh -huh, I know not. I am I my brother's keeper? This is kind of like at my house. Nobody did it. Nobody knows what happened. I don't know where he's at. Verse 10, And he said, What hast thou done? The voice of thy brother's blood crieth unto me from the ground. And now thou art cursed from the earth, which hath opened her mouth to receive thy brother's blood from thy hand. When thou tillest the ground, it shall not henceforth yield unto thee her strength. A fugitive and a vagabond shalt thou be in the earth. Now what's the purpose of God's discipline? When God sends discipline into somebody's life, whether they're lost or not, I mean, Ezekiel is a book of condemnation for the nations other than Israel, and 40-something times in the book of Ezekiel, the Bible says that they may know that I am the Lord. The purpose of this was not necessarily to punish Cain, but to have Cain come to his senses and repent. But that's not what Cain does. God says you're going to be a uh, vagabond. You're going to just move from place to plain, place. And Cain says unto the Lord, My punishment is greater than I can bear. Behold, thou hast driven me out this day from the face of the earth, and from the face, thy face shall I be hid, and I shall be a fugitive and a vagabond in the earth. And it shall come to pass that every one that findeth me shall slay me. And the Lord said, No, no, it ain't going to work like that. And the Lord said unto him, Therefore, whosoever slayeth Cain, vengeance shall be upon him, taken upon him sevenfold. And the Lord set a mark upon Cain, lest any... Finding him should kill him. Now, the Lord says, you're going to be a vagabond. If I am repentant in my traveling, I'm going to be calling on God to fix me. I'm going to be calling on God to change me. I'm going to be calling on God to save me. But look what he does. Cain went out from the presence of the Lord and dwelt in the land of Nod on the east of Eden. Cain knew his wife. She conceived and bare Enoch, and he built a city. Now, God just told him he was supposed to wander from place to place. But he said, no, nah, not me. I'm building a city. And he called the city after his son's name, Enoch. It's Enochsville, right? And Enoch was born Eriad and Eriad. Mahujael and begat Methusael, and Methusael begat Lamech, and Lamech took unto him two wives, and the name of the one was Ada, and the other Zillah. And Ada bare Jabel, he was the father of such as dwell in tents, of such as have cattle. And his brother's name was Jubal, and he was the father of all such that as handle the harp and organ. And Zillah, she also bare Tubal Cain, an instructor of the artificers in brass and iron, and the sister of of Tubal Cain was Nama, and Lamech said unto his wives, Ada and Zillah, Hear my voice, ye wives of Lamech, hearken to my speech, for I have slain a man to my wounding and a young man to my hurt. Basically, what he's saying is, Hey, Cain was tough, he killed his brother, but me, I killed a young man. I'm, I'm, Cain was tough, but I'm, I mean, Abel was tough, but I'm, I know Cain was tough, but I'm tougher. Okay? So it's all about him. If Cain shall be avenged sevenfold, truly Lamech seventy and sevenfold. So you see how he's trying to, he, you know, he's trying to build up. If Cain was tough and, and bad and hated by God, then I'm, I'm tougher and badder and more hated by God. And Adam knew his wife again, and she bare a son and called his name Seth, for God said she, for God said she, hath appointed me another seed instead of Abel, whom Cain slew, and to Seth to him also was born a son, and his called his name Enos, then began men to call upon the name of the Lord. So let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I ask that you control my words from here out. My mind's wandering, trying to cover a hundred things at one time. I ask that you Guide me, control my speech, have me say what you'd have me say in the way you'd have me say it, Lord. And I pray you'd keep John out of it, but let your people see Jesus and what he wants to do for them in this day. For it's in Christ's name I ask it. Amen. So basically, we won't take the time because y'all know I'm naturally long-winded to look in Exodus. But in Exodus, God's people were commanded to bring the first fruits of the ground. And the first fruits of the flock. Cain did not bring the first fruits. He brought of the fruit. So he didn't bring the very first thing he was supposed to bring. He just brought what it was convenient. Sadly, I think I can imagine this, Brother Jerry. I didn't look the week that Denise was out of town. I was busy trying to go to work trying to check on the boys and all this kind of stuff i didn't look at the squash the whole week i should be shot but i didn't at the end of the week when she got home there was some fruit on the vine but it was not edible 
Y'all seen those squashes? They're about yay long. They got knots all over them because they're hard as a rock. That's what was on the ground. Because I didn't do my job and take care of it. That would be akin to when we read Malachi this morning. It talked about how they polluted the altar. They gave the lambs that weren't healthy. We're, we're supposed to. What Abel did is what the believers have always been supposed to do. Give the first fruits. Give the first 10%. Abel didn't just pick the first lamb, but of the first lambs born, he picked the fattest lamb. He picked the very best one and gave it to God. Where Cain just brought some fruit of the ground. If I take Cain's offering and make it to make Abel's offering mirror Cain's offering, it would be like me going, hmm, that ram right there's got bottle jaw. His jaw's swollen up. He could die in the next couple of days. Let me go sacrifice that one to the Lord. And this one over here, he's nice and fat. I'm going to keep him because he's going to do well at the market. You see? That is the, uh, that's kind of what Cain did. He just brought any old fruit of the ground. You see, when we come, we've been talking about how our worship is maybe, maybe, if the preacher feels this way, I feel pretty confident maybe some of us could feel this way. Our worship is just when it's convenient. And we give to God what's convenient of our time, of our talents, maybe even of our money. I, I don't know what you give. I don't want to know what you give because I feel like preachers shouldn't know that. It could affect the way they preach the gospel. But I feel like that worship is not center place in our life. That's how, that's how God pointed out to Cain that he wasn't right with him was during the worship service, during the part that you give. That's how Cain knew. And if you see, Cain, he, he never repents. Okay? So it's not that God chose Abel to be saved and Cain to go to hell. I, I can't ever wrap my mind around how somebody could preach such as that. The problem was Cain refused to repent. And you see the deeper descent into darkness of sin where his son, he, I'm supposed to wonder, but now I'm going to build a city. I'm going to name it after my son. And then you see his grandson who's singing, basically, I did it my way. He's singing about how tough I am. I'm the baddest. I'm the meanest. Nobody's meaner than me. If God's mad at Cain, he's really going to be mad at me. That's what it says about him. Then we get back to God's side. You see, Eve didn't know. We know that that seed talked about in 315 is, John, is Jesus. But Eve just knew God was going to send a redeemer through her. So she's expecting it to be Cain. Then she's expecting it to be Abel. Now she's expecting it to be Seth. But look at the last few verses again. We're looking at verse 25 and 26, the last two verses. Adam knew his wife again. She bare a son, called his name Seth. For God said she, for God, said she, hath appointed me another seed instead of Abel whom Cain slew. So you can see she's referring back to Genesis 3.15. I will put enmity between thee and the woman, between thy seed and her seed, and it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. <clears throat> okay? So that's the, the first, basically, mention of the gospel there. But look, Seth... To him also there was born a son, and he called his name Enos. Now look at that last phrase. Then began men to call upon the name of the Lord. I really believe that's his tombstone. That's, what, that's the only thing we know of Enos. He's not mentioned anywhere else in Scripture. It says, in his life began men to call upon the name of the Lord. Now that that phrase is used two and maybe three ways in Scripture. Clearly, we have gathered this morning to call upon the name of the Lord. So public worship. And I can show you some examples of that in Scripture. For the sake of time, I'm not going to. The other way that I know for 100% sure that it's mentioned is Romans 10, 13. Emma Joy, can you quote Romans 10, 13? For whosoever 
Nope. That's exactly right. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Call upon the name of the Lord. Same phrase. Public worship. The other way that I think, and I've read several verses where it's found, and I, I can't say dogmatically that it's referring to it, but I believe it is referring to it. It's just what Janice's grandson said about, or great nephew said about her, and what uh, the people said of Sheffy, which is intercessory prayer. If she prays for it, it's going to happen. If he prays for it, it's going to happen. Wouldn't it be good? If that's what people said about us, if Brother John prays for it, I know it's going to happen. If Brother Jerry prays for it, I know it's going to happen. Wouldn't it be good if people said, when Brother Jerry's around, people get saved. When Brother Michael's around, people get saved. That's what the man, that's the only thing we know of the man. <laughs> Would to God that's all they knew of us, is that when we were around, People called upon the name of the Lord. I think that's a revival because it affected Enos vertically. He's right with God. And because he was so right with God, people say, Christy, that you, 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 somebody can be so heavenly minded, they're no earthly good. I think that's garbage because if I'm heavenly minded, I'm going to be earthly minded to try to take people with me to heaven. If I'm heavenly minded, what happens, Jake, in heaven when somebody gets saved? Anybody know? I call Jake, but anybody can answer. What happens when somebody gets saved? Rejoice. There's great rejoicing in heaven. People say the angels rejoice. That's not actually what the scriptures say. It's a rabbit trail. I don't guess it's terribly important. But it says there is rejoicing in the presence of angels. So basically the believers who have died and gone to heaven praise the Lord every time somebody gets saved. So to be heavenly minded is to be mindful of the souls around us. His tombstone read, during his life, people began to call upon the name of the Lord. Now I'm going to shut up now because I feel like the Lord's telling me to. But I'm telling you, that's what I want on my tombstone. I want to live my life in such a way that when I die, whether I die an untimely death like my father or whether I live a long, death, long life like like. Miss Ivy Lee or like my grandfather, when I die, I want it said that during his lifetime, people called upon the name of the Lord. But you see, Jake, there's really not a lot I can do to make that happen. The only one thing I can do to make that happen is to strive daily and moment by moment to have my relationship with Christ where I am a sweet-smelling savor, not only to him, but to the world around me. See, I, I, can't, I can't make anyone get saved. I can't make anyone worship the Lord. If I could, bless God, the house would be full this morning. Amen? But I, I can't do that. Miss Karen, you can't do that. None of us can make our family, our friends, our neighbors get right with God. But we can't. It's just like Brother Charles said in Sunday school this morning. We get so tied up with what's going to happen in an hour or what's going to happen in two hours or in two days or in two months that we forget about eternity. Friends, we've got to get our minds on eternity so that God can affect us, so that through us God can affect others. I'm convinced sinners haven't changed and the Savior hasn't changed. We are tied up trying to establish our own righteousness. You say, well, we all know we're saved by grace. I got a friend. I'm not going to use names for, for, for reasons this is going to be on it, but I've got a friend that works downtown Amory, and a preacher called my friend and questioned his bill, right? Does my friend remember this story? And uh, <clears throat> my friend explained to the preacher the bill and the preacher says how do I know you're telling the truth and my friend said you know that's calling me a liar now my friend is grinning but we're all just as guilty right 
Because what that is, we know the Bible says that every man's a liar. We know the Bible says that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But when people attack us, we want to establish our righteousness. Even if they're not attacking us. There's so much foolishness going on in the name of Christ around this country right now. I don't see how in the world a revival can come. Because we want to prove how we're better Christians than these other people. But if we're right with God, our standing amongst other people matters nothing. It's where do I stand with him? Okay? Now, I'm not picking on my buddy because I'm guilty of the same thing. I had a guy call me at work Friday, and I was mad 30 seconds into the conversation because... His conversation let me know that he didn't trust me. And I'm thinking, I'm the one that shouldn't trust you, bud. You know, but that, that's sin on my part, okay? Michael, I learned this when I had preachers turn their backs on me. I say I learned it, but I need to learn it again. I had some preachers turn their backs on me, say some stuff about me that wasn't true, and I tried to defend myself. That's trying to establish my own righteousness. You say, you mean I can never defend myself? I'm telling you, a wise man who's gone on to glory told a preacher, a man, y'all, everybody has mentioned the song I sang at the funeral. That song, I know it from the funeral of the man I'm talking about. His name was B.R. Lakin, and he told a younger preacher, never defend yourself. The preacher was being attacked. He was being called a liberal and a compromiser when he wasn't. He was busy about God's work. And the old preacher said to him, don't defend yourself. Well, why not? Because your friends don't need it and your enemies aren't going to believe it. Just give it to Christ and keep rolling. We've got to be concerned about our relationship with Christ. If our tombstone is going to read during their lives, people began to call upon the name of the Lord, then I've got to quit worrying about everybody else and start worrying about John Stuart Hallman because he's the only person in whose life I have a very little bit of control. You can look at my waistline and see he doesn't have, I don't have the control of my life I'd like to have. And I've got a little bit of control of what I do. If my tombstone is going to say, during his life, people began to call upon the name of the Lord for salvation, for worship, and intercessory prayer, then I've got to work on John and allow the Lord, really, I've got to ask the Lord to work on John. How did the psalmist say? The psalmist said to the Lord, turn us I can't turn myself. Michael, you may be one of, the, one of the most determined men in the world, but the only person that can change you for eternity's sake and make you more like Christ is Christ. And all you can do is submit to him. Charles is one of the nicest men I have ever met in my entire life. Charles did stuff for me when he didn't really know me from Adam. He reached out and helped me in ways that I could never, ever repay but the only thing that can make Charles more like Christ is his submission to Christ. The problem with John is I try to rest on my laurels of what God has done in the past. But let the past be the past. Let's let Christ work in our lives so that we can see our friends and neighbors call upon the name of the Lord. And if we end up like Jeremiah, the weeping prophet, with no known converts, then he will give us the ability to continue faithfully. What did Jeremiah do? Bo, Jeremiah tried to quit on Christ. But Christ wouldn't let him. Jeremiah said, it was like a fire shut up in my bones. I started to try to sing a song to y'all this morning. It's been a great blessing to me. I must have listened to it 50 times this week. Because he said, I've been held by the Savior. I have felt fire from above. I want that fire again. I hope you do. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I love you. I'm so weak. <laughs> 